Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Unstoppable Podcast. I'm your host, Diana Chen, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Matthew Gold, co-founder and CEO at Unstoppable Domains, and our guest today, Yat Sui. He's the founder and chairman of the board at Animoca Brands. Welcome, Yat. I'm so happy to have you here. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So to start off, you've you're involved in a lot of things, but the main thing we want to talk to you today about is Animoca Brands and your interest in NFTs and all of that good stuff. But take us back to the start of your crypto journey. How did you get involved in crypto in the first place? Uh, so maybe I'll start actually how we got involved actually with NFTs because I mean, the crypto stuff is interesting, but maybe a little boring. <laughs> but I think the more interesting part is how we got involved in NFTs. So we actually were investors uh, and eventually acquired a small studio in Vancouver called Fuel Powered, whose uh, sort of uh, CEO and co-founder was a person called Mick Naim, who became a co-founder of uh, Dapper Labs, uh, the company behind um, CryptoKitties. And at the time, he was sharing an office together with um, another person uh, running a company called Axiom Zen that was basically founded by Rohan. And they both were uh, sort of working together on this little experiment called CryptoKitties. And of course, at the time when we were discussing sort of the acquisition of fuel powered, uh, you know, CryptoKitties was not meant to be part of the program at all. It was just more like an experiment. Let's see how it goes. Uh, and then midway through our sort of completion of the transaction, uh, CryptoKitties just took off, right? Like a, like in a big way, uh, in the end of 2017. And through that arrangement, uh, because Rohan basically asked me, you know what, come join us and sort of go full time on this because it's going to change the world and, we we kind of sort of agreed as, as well from that. So we said, look, you know, Mick was going to join you. He's going to advise us. Um, we're still going to acquire fuel powered, but uh, we would then also have a closer relationship and uh, become your publishers for at the time what was CryptoKitties uh, in our part of the world. And so that was sort of marked the beginning of our journey with NFTs pretty early um, sort of in the development. And we also kind of had a quasi front row sort of seat as to everything that was going on there. Uh, and ultimately, that also led us to become a shareholder in Dapper Labs as well. So that was sort of sort of our beginning in that journey. Got it. And so this was probably around 2018 when CryptoKitties was getting big. 2017. 2017. So 2017. Yeah. 2017. yeah. And, then early, and then we became publishers in actually January of 2018. So, so it was very, very fast. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. So back in 2017, I mean, NFTs weren't really a thing. They weren't really talked about beyond crypto kitties. You know, people are just now in 2021 starting to understand what NFTs are. So back in 2017, how did you start learning about NFTs and, you know, understanding, like, how did you wrap your mind around this concept? Because people are still struggling with this today. So I think the part that sort of uh, sort of the light bulb moment that was went off for us was um, the fact that you could actually have real true digital ownership, one that uh, we as a as the entity that produced them, so to speak, uh, you know, could not alter or change, right? And I think this is this is the part that is important because we view NFTs actually as property rights, not necessarily as just sort of you know an image or something. It represents essentially a contract of true ownership that you have between whatever asset that is being represented. And the other thing that was really interesting about CryptoKitties was that actually the creation of the kitties outside of the generation sort of Gen, gen sort of Gen Zero cats, um, the generation, the revenue that would be generated uh, was only done through other people breeding cats and essentially trading those cats. And then the company would make money from the revenue share of that. And I remember one of the interesting conversations we had when we were discussing, so sort of, we actually did the publishing deal with HTC that sort of launched a crypto phone and combined it with CryptoKitties. And we talked about bundling CryptoKitties with the HTC phone. And, uh, you know, we said, oh, yeah, okay, well, we can give you some CryptoKitties, but it's going to cost $15 for a pair of them. And you know, it was like, what? <laughs> I actually have to buy these things from the market and uh, bundle it with the phone. I can't just sort of, you know, you can't just give them to me and I can just upload them or something. It didn't work that way, right? So it was, um, it was sort of that concept of that true digital ownership that uh, for us was sort of the light bulb uh, that allowed us to um, sort of think about that space in terms of the gaming space, particularly because we're a video game company. And the other thing that was big for us is, you know, for anyone who's been in the video gaming for a long time, uh, we 
you know, often dream about the ability to actually openly trade these assets to be able to transfer ownership on them. We can't actually do that. Uh, prior to that, there were services like Item Bay. Now, uh, obviously, eBay has sort of black market approaches in terms of people trading assets. So that market already existed before, just wasn't sort of allowed to be done in a sort of legal way. Uh, and sort of NFTs represented a way in which we could do that. And so for us, that was sort of, uh, you know, that, that big sort of um, moment where we could do that because the assets are owned by the user um, and they're not owned by, um, they're not owned by the company or studio. That must have been actually a pretty interesting conversation because you're talking to one of these large phone manufacturers for a distribution deal. And, and they're like, what do you mean I have to buy them? And you're like, well, we, we just, we didn't, you know, uh, didn't think about how you could maybe incorporate that distribution in. And I think that's something that crypto has a problem with just across the board is how do you, how do you, uh, on these on chain assets, how do you also work in with your distribution partners? This is a chicken and the egg problem of trying to get these things out there, um, and in people's hands. Uh, and I think that that's, Super cool that you guys are already trying to think about getting NFTs into people's hands um, so early. Uh, but before we dive into that, I actually kind of want to ask um, if, if we're trying to explain NFTs to uh, someone who may be not in the space, like how do you explain it to your mom? It is, uh, and I understand the property rights part, but I always like to get people inside, get them. How, what's your two sentences? Because I'm sure you get asked all the time. Well, I don't know if I have a appropriate response for, you know, you know, my grandma, right? <laughs> but, but the way that I just like to describe non fungible tokens, um, outside of the property rights context is I think of them as open digital assets. So to me, non fungible tokens, uh, will do to digital assets what open source did to code. I think that's the way that, uh, we like to explain it, at least in terms of the possibilities there. Uh, and that's possible because you have property rights. So what I mean by that is if you take it from the real world example, when we own physical assets, we have the ability to alter and change them and do whatever we want because we truly own it. I can buy a car, I can paint it, I can change the seats, I can add value, I can resell it. I can get a loan on it, I can do whatever I want with it. I can't do that with our digital assets in any game today, actually, right? So because I don't own it. But with an NFT, I have this component of an open digital asset which means I can add layers of experiences and value on top of it in any which way I please. In fact, I don't even know how you will do it. Something will come up that's kind of cool. And, you know, there you go. And then whether you resell it, whether you wrap it, <laughs> whether you sort of, you know, give a lending product, whether you provide a fractionalization service, these are all added layers that you can add on this because the person who you interact with truly owns it. So I think of that as the layer um, that, for me, is the true power of what non fungible tokens represents. And so I'm kind of curious, like, you said a lot of the use cases aren't really out yet, we don't really know how people are, you know, what are changes that people can make, like when we're talking about a car or a house, we know, you know, basic things, you can paint it, you can rearrange the furniture, the seats, things like that. But if you were, I, I'm sure you've given this some amount of thought, like say you bought a piece of digital art or any other kind of digital asset, what are some, you know, like creative or more practical things that you can do with it to make it feel more like you own it in the traditional physical sense than just, you know, in a virtual sense? So I guess maybe I want to challenge that thinking about why is it important to own it in a physical sense? Um, you know, Certainly, if you have kids or the younger generation, you know, I don't think they care that much about how they're necessarily physically represented as much as they're virtually represented. You know, their stats in game is more important. The number of likes they have on Instagram is perhaps more important, right? Um, how they're viewed virtually is perhaps more important than they're viewed uh, sort of physically. You know, I'm, you know, I'm from a generation where people sort of wanted to be sort of seen where the paparazzi was in terms of newspaper sort of a uh, sort of um, sort of articles or sort of magazine covers and oh look he was there at that restaurant or that bar or that club or something right um that's not a narrative that is that big anymore it's more like you know what game are you playing you know how many kills have you achieved how cool are you in this kind of virtual world or another so i think i think that's part of that paradigm that's changed a bit as well where we're, we're trying to make a bridge which is relevant i mean you could have you know, a screen, you can have a cool video representation, but I feel that's limiting its potential. I feel that we're still trying to fit it in some kind of, um, call it old world order, which I don't think, um, is, is really necessary. Uh, and that's, that's, that's why we twist ourselves a bit. 
Yeah, I, lo- I love that. I love that challenge to, you know, the traditional way of thinking. And so if we kind of go off of that conversation and talk about like, how can, what is the impact that we can have on uh, NFTs digitally? So for example, like, would I be able to sell a tweet? Like, say I tweet something that I think is really funny, really clever, hasn't been tweeted before. Would I be able to sell that tweet with the goal of sort of like getting making it go viral, getting a lot of likes and retweets and, you know, getting famous that way or or whatever the case may be. Like, let's just envision some like real cases that could potentially happen. So, I mean, the tweet example is perhaps interesting just because of, of Jack Dorsey's sort of a uh, sort of auction of the, of the, of, of that tweet. Um, the issue with the tweet, um, as exciting as, as interesting as it is, and perhaps even historic is the fact that the tweet resides in a centralized environment. And actually that was demonstrated earlier when someone bought a tweet and then the owner, this is a poster of the tweet actually promptly deleted it, uh, probably just to make a statement. Maybe the, the that very, in itself. It was yeah. the very first rug pull on an NFT. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, you know, when you think of it as an expression of sort of as an expression, which is maybe a form of art, maybe that was the whole point, right? You know, that, that they tried to sort of demonstrate. But I think that is part of the issue about interfacing uh, something like a non-fungible token with something that is actually in a centralized set- setup, which means that you own it, but do you really, right? And that's the part where if you can actually make the asset truly a non-fungible token and it resides in a digital context in its truest form, um, which we think of in terms of NFTs because they're born digital, as it were, then you actually truly own it and it can't be taken away from you. Whereas here, it's really a sort of context of, of that. Uh, but the way to think of that is autographs, right? It's kind of like an autograph. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I've got the original signature, the original version of that, and that's an example of that. Where I think open digital assets really uh, sort of add value, these non-fungible tokens, there's sort of multiple layers to it. But the first one, obviously, is the benefit that it gives power back to the creators. Because as we've seen now, many artists and creators actually make more money from the secondary um, resale in the secondary markets from these assets than they do from the primary sale. And they continue to make a royalty of that going forward. That's a very powerful way uh, and a very powerful sort of statement of what it means for the future of creators, something that wasn't possible before. I mean, imagine if in the physical art world, you know, the estate of Picasso was able to generate a small percentage of the sale that happened every single time in Sotheby's or Christie's or elsewhere. Actually, the amount of value that would be generated for uh, Sotheby's, but also every other Picasso owner would be a tremendous because the estate would have more funds to promote or create or produce um, sort of the message um, of, of Picasso, right? So I think it puts value in the right places. And I think that is sort of an important part of that transparency. The other part about this is where I go back to open digital assets is that we don't yet, um, we don't really have the full picture of what people can do. We're only really scratching the surface. And I'm, I'm, I'm from an age, sort of, when I came to Hong Kong in 93, I started one of Hong Kong's first internet service providers in 93. Okay, so there were maybe tens of thousands of internet users. It was an idea that was a little bit too early. But, you know, by, way back then, there was a big movement. And that was open source. And the idea that we should be using open source as opposed to closed source for probably a good 10 years felt ridiculous because how could you sort of compete with sort of, you know, the professional code that would be delivered by, you know, third party companies and, uh, you know, and, and so forth. But now you can't compete against, um, uh, sort of, um, open source. You have to embrace open source. And by us, you know, it's a great example of the network effect that open source delivered. You know, the code of millions, the intelligence of millions come together and basically then deliver that incredible sort of knowledge that really created a, let's call it innovation revolution, as it were. And now, you know, the startup tech scene would not have been possible if it wasn't for the fact that there was open source. And that is important um, uh, for the, for let's, in terms of innovation for code and software, but it hasn't happened for digital assets, right? For, and, and the reason that it couldn't happen is because the code, uh, the, the actual digital assets would be stuck in, um, in these centralized platforms. And, and uh, now that they're open and free, uh, we can start sort of add, doing things to them that I think we have still yet to discover. Well, uh, that's actually, so I want to take it up a little bit here and I wanted to talk a little bit 
specifically about Animoca and uh, what digital assets you guys are currently um, issuing and kind of where you where you guys in, are in the market. So I would love to just hear a little bit more about what you guys are working on um, over there currently. Uh, and you, what do you see as the next couple of things that you guys are going to be rolling out over at Animoca just to kind of set us in a time and place here on the discussion? Yeah. So, I mean, Animoca Brands is the company behind Sandbox, uh, which uh, was quite well known in terms of um, sort of selling digital land and basically doing sort of a game called Sandbox, which is a blockchain equivalent of Minecraft or Roblox. Uh, we feel that sort of user generated content, creating your NFTs and sort of um, also being a real estate developer, if you will, in the virtual context. Um, and that's been quite successful. I mean, not too long ago, we sort of sold roughly $3 million worth of land in like, I think, five minutes or so. Um, the other thing, uh, the other product I think that we've been pushing out a fair bit is um, F1 Delta Time um, and the Rev Token. F1 Delta Time is uh, officially li sort of um, licensed title using Formula One uh, and it's a blockchain racing game. It has many elements of DeFi that's built in there. So you can, you know, sort of the staking and yield generation, but also you can play a game where you can race and, and win. And we've got basically people forming racing teams. Um, you know, and again, actually just today, uh, we sold um, uh, almost $2 million worth of racetracks uh, that was sold out in like 23 minutes. So uh, quite a bit of demand in that space. Uh, we are also heavy investors in the NFT space. So we're investors in OpenSea, we're investors in Axie Infinity, uh, Wax, uh, Decentraland. I mean, just a whole, whole so actually 35 companies in that space. Part of the reason we did that is when we entered this space in 20, and of course Dapper Labs, uh, when we entered that space in 2018, uh, there was actually a pretty lonely field. <laughs> Nobody was really investing in that. And so to help build an ecosystem, we thought, well, maybe we need to sort of do something about that as well. And so we invested in many of those companies to help bring up uh, sort of uh, uh, th that ecosystem at that time. So uh, so we kept doing that until, I guess, 20, we were continuing to invest. Uh, most recently, we, we made an investment in NFTFI, which is the um, lending platform uh, for NFTs. Uh, but... But this is something that, uh, you know, obviously is, 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 is no longer as needed because, uh, you know, lots of funding is now going into the NFT space as, as compared to before. Well, I remember because Unstoppable, we make NFT blockchain domain names and we were founded in, in January 2018. So I remember exactly what it was like in 2018. And we actually, you know, know the Rarible guys and the OpenSea guys um, and all the people inside the space. And it was such a tiny community <laughs> three years ago. And then it has absolutely exploded over the past couple of years. Or actually, I would just say mostly in the last six months. Um, even six months ago, you could, you could go and get NFTs. Um, a friend of mine actually got the Paris Hilton nft uh off of last summer and i think now that you wouldn't be able to get that for less than you know seven figures uh just seeing what's happened in the last six months it's really been crazy you touched on a few things there that i really want to talk about uh, and some of those have to do with incentives and how these connect to the digital world so you actually mentioned some things so i'd like to talk about f1 uh, delta or, or you know the game that you guys have so i'm actually very curious um you had a couple of, sounds like you have a couple of DeFi incentives inside that game, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, so you have a game, it has race cars. I think I can understand that. Uh, how do I, you know, how do I have tokens that I stake? You know, how am I earning yield or interest on that? I'd love to just kind of hear a little bit more about how that game works. So, so, in example, so right now, um, you know, what you can do is uh, you can stake your cars. Essentially, you stake your NFTs. And then you receive yield, uh, in the form of, um, in the form of the rev token, uh, which you can then trade or buy other assets with. Uh, what's interesting about that approach is it's sort of a precursor of an example of what could be ultimately a, a rental program because you end up basically staking your cars into a pool that can then be used by others. All right. So that's, that's one example. Uh, the other thing, of course, uh, when you stake cars is it ends up taking NFTs out of supply in the market. And that's an interesting sort of paradigm, right? Everyone talks about sort of how do I take tokens out of supply? But if your focus is around sort of delivering value to the assets, then maybe there should be a, an interesting way in which you can take uh, NFTs out of supply. So it's a little bit of a thought experiment in terms of sort of scarcity around actual sort of circulating NFTs. The other thing that we do that is um, why the racetracks I think are popular. Uh, and in fact, I think our uh, sort of um, um, racetrack, the sort of first one that we sold actually, uh, Medicoven from the Metapurse, he actually sort of auctioned that one off for, at the time, 220,000 US dollars. Those racetracks generate yield um, because when you actually play on the tracks, 
uh, and there's like fees to be paid and sort of prize money, track owners get a share of that. They do have to do some work, but they get a share of that uh, in terms of um, um, revenue. And that's, you know, basically how the real world operates, except now it's done in a virtual sense. So the more races take place uh, on those tracks, the more fees you end up generating. Uh, ultimately, Okay. So I want to unpack that for people listening, because that was that was a lot of really cool things that you just suggested there. So uh, I'm going to see, I'm going to try to unpack this. I always like to pretend that I'm trying to explain this to my own dad. So uh, what you just said there is, so we have these digital NFTs now. And then one thing that you said earlier that I thought was really cool is maybe people should you know, care less about physical things that they're owning because everyone's moving into this digital world. And so we have all these new things that we're creating as these you know, digital NFTs that people have. Uh, and then an interesting thing about having uh, digital collectibles as opposed to like a physical one, like a Beanie Baby, um, is you can build incentives into them. And and I actually want to talk to you about incentives, but you just mentioned three and I want to go through each of them. So renting is a very interesting incentive. Like uh, I can imagine if you have a collectible, like a Beanie Baby at your house, it's very hard to rent that to somebody else if they want to use it for a little while because they could destroy it. Right. And then it would. But with a digital NFT, you could rent that to somebody. Uh, and, you know, they're not going to do any harm to it. And then even better than that, you can put it inside of a contract so you know you would get it back. So you don't even have to worry about it being stolen in some cases, which is interesting. Another one that you mentioned was like supply uh, reduction. And I guess this is more about um, specific in-game mechanics. There are certain things that uh, I guess you can imagine people playing the race car game, for instance, and uh, you, you, you've been trying to win this race for a very long time. And you realize that this guy's car is no longer um on in the game because someone has taken it out of the game so maybe you want to race because you can never beat him right but now you know he's gone so so <laughs> that can also be something else that comes in there and then the last one you said which is interesting i wanted to kind of talk about was um the the idea that someone could build their own uh, racetrack which is essentially like a level inside of a game uh at least inside of my head and so inside this digital world you could build you know, a specific a specific area of the game that people could only get access to, and maybe you could charge for that. And so that makes a very more interesting way for people to connect on these open protocols for people to uh, come together. So those are three that you just said there. Uh, and I think most people don't realize uh, that all these incentives are going to create all sorts of things that we can't even imagine that people could do with these digital assets. So you gave us three there that I thought were pretty interesting. I was wondering... Do you have some other ideas uh, floating around about incentives um, that, that you would you think maybe uh, that you guys are looking at this next year that we may be interested in seeing coming out? I'm very curious what you guys are thinking on in this space. Right, right. Well, first of all, I mean, the beautiful thing about sort of um, crypto and blockchain gaming is that there's no shortage of ideas, right? Everyone basically has all sorts of new creative ways in which they can experiment. And often sort of we're ideating, uh, ideating them sort of somewhat on the fly as well, because we are experimenting as to, as to, as to how to do that, right? Uh, one of the things that uh, we're quite focused on is because of the value of these assets have increased so dramatically, uh, you know, how do we sort of bring in new players into the field? that uh, can afford to spend you know, $20,000 basically to play our games, which is kind of expensive. So what we're thinking about is, for instance, creating a new race layer experience that allows them to sort of you know, farm essentially rev that they can then afford to play. So it's almost quasi free to play-ish of sorts, uh, but essentially uh, without trying to upset an existing economy because we can't sort of make more, uh, we shouldn't be making more assets that are cheaper. Uh, you know, we shouldn't sort of devalue the economy. We have to really be mindful of that. And it's actually no different than, you know, sort of managing land supply, for instance, in the city or a country. We have to manage that um, balance as well. So these are, these are sort of elements that we have to think about, sort of, um, uh, think about sort of how to do that and, and, and integrate that. In terms of experiments on, on DeFi, I mean, one of the things for us uh, that we think of this is that, you know, the asset themselves can be a collectible purely of itself, but we think the power of the NFT becomes truly apparent when there is deep utility. So the goal that we have for our uh, NFTs is that utility extends beyond our games. Right? That's actually our long-term mission here, uh, which means that we're hoping that these assets get used in other games. We're hoping that other people adapt them in their own particular ways, whether they park them outside, you know, sandbox, or whether they actually sort of use them somewhere else. Uh, and, you know, lending protocols is just one way of taking it out and providing another service. 
Obviously, some people choose to fractionalize it. But here's an interesting example. Fractionalization is something a lot of people talk about NFTs. But none of our F1 Delta Time car owners want to fractionalize it because they can't use them otherwise, right? So that means, why should I fractionalize it? Because I can get more value driving the car or doing that, right? So one of the things that we are now looking at building, which is important, is how to create a setup where people can drive cars where you have a separate owner. Because one of the things that we've now experienced, uh, and so people have done this on a trust basis already, but you know it's not done on a contract level, so it doesn't really scale. So the next thing that we need to do is find a way where an owner can hire a driver like for, on a contract basis, rather than just simply sort of on a, okay, let's share a wallet and let's work together, which is what's happening right now, right? Because there's uh, there's no actual mechanism to do that. And we're multiple race teams. That do this. You guys uh, need to make yeah. timeshares on the blockchain <laughs> so that people can, yes. you know. <laughs> and, and one of the things that we discovered is so we have two kind of game modes on F1 Delta Time. And the first one that we launched was a uh, time trial and then elite trials, which is basically like a statistics based game. You know, you basically take your parts, you combine it, and then you race and you have to m sort of measure the weather. And then there you go, you've got results. That proved to be quite popular and remains one of our sort of our popular events. And then we finally launched the game which is really a skill-based game where you're racing with the assets. And the the sort of the, the skill-based element ended up becoming perhaps even more than 50% of the game itself. So the assets were important, but skill ended up sort of tipping the balance. Whereas a statistics-based game, it was really just around getting the right statistics and people built spreadsheets, people built programs to analyze it and sort of did that. But when it came to skill-based, a whole bunch of a whole bunch of guys are like, actually, I'm not that good at this, right? I need to do I need to find someone else to help me that. And that in itself then created a new kind of economy by itself and a different kind of barrier. So the type of games and experiences you build uh, will end up also creating different kind of economic incentives that we have not for sort of uh, sort of envisioned at the time. I think I think that is actually inc an incredible insight. So I'm going to unpack that from my own playing games online. You can imagine a situation where like I may be really good at uh, doing one part of the game, right? But then in order to accomplish another part of the game, I may not be very good at it. And and right now, if you're playing a game online, it's like you as your character have to do everything, or maybe you as a group of characters have to do everything together. But it could be in the future that like, I have to I have to make a friend on the, on the internet and say like, hey, like I really can't do this race course. Like I built the car because I'm a really good mechanic and I love that part of the game and I'm really good at that part, but I just can't beat this race course. And until I beat this race course boss, I don't get to go to the next level and there's somebody else on the internet. And now I've just made a friend and I'm like, hey, you can borrow my car for an afternoon and then drive it and then, and then he can play that part of the game and then he can beat it for me. And then maybe I can go to the next thing. Thing. So um, I really kind of like that because it's more ways to have richer uh, connections with other people in a digital environment. But of course, you know, I'm sitting here and I have I have my VR I have my VR headset over here on my right. So like I'm the wrong part. The, you know, I'm definitely all the way out on the edge of this thing. But I think that that's super cool. Uh, one other thing I want to talk about uh, before we kind of move on to the next section is actually creators. Uh, and specifically, I want to talk about artists because you, we mentioned this really earlier. I think people are missing this, but it's pretty easy. Is that uh, a work of art can pay someone or like a work of music or something can pay them every time it gets transferred in the future on the secondary market. Uh, and the example that I give is if I'm like a young and developing artist, sometimes I'll sell my work only for a couple thousand dollars. And then 15 years later, you know, maybe someone says that that's my best work that I did, you know, much earlier in my life. And that, that art piece will resell for, you know, $15 million. Like if I'm really good at whatever it is and I'll get zero on that secondary sale. And the nice thing about these digital assets is that you can put inside the code itself that whenever this thing gets transferred, you know, for money on these secondary exchanges, that the original creator gets a portion of that. And so I look at that as like a way of, uh, kind of smoothing out your lifetime earnings, right? So as an as a young artist, you can, uh, and it also aligns incentives. So I just think that that's um, really cool. So I'd like to pass that back to you and see if you've seen that, um, you know, in, in in the companies that you've worked with and just kind of getting your opinion on how that's, how you think that's going to help creators, one, make more money now, and then two, like align incentives between creatives uh, and their audience over, over time. So, 
I think the way to think of this, the way we think about this is that, yes, absolutely, you're right, right? Creators have this ability to generate more value from secondary sales, perhaps, or at least value over time. Whether it's smooth is over sales or so may not even be the main point. I think the main point is that you are justly rewarded for the work that you've done and you create a collaborative uh, environment with your collector owner of these assets. And I think that's the part that's really quite powerful because at the end of the day, it is rarely the artist that makes his art famous. It is often the collector uh, or the collector as a community. Oh, we all own Picassos. That should be valuable. Let's go work together and sort of tell the narrative, right? And that's that's the power of what sort of blockchain and in effect tokenizing has done, right? It's created a value system within a community. Uh, you know, we see this with social tokens. And NFTs is a form of a social token, if you will, or sort of social non-fungible token, because it represents a piece, particularly from a creator standpoint, of him or herself, right? And that representation is then ultimately owned by a collection of people out there, non-fungible or fungible. And then what happens is, is that they talk about it. They, 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 they participate in it. They maybe resell it. And every time they resell it, they actually grow the narrative of the artist and they become closer to the artist in that process. So it actually is a very deep way in where value and true value generation happens, we think. Now, this isn't just it's sort of an artist making an art and then is resold. The composability and the adaptation that happens, as I say about open digital assets, is where I think it's exciting. With F1 Delta Time, for instance, we don't have a creator element per se, but people basically build cars with all the parts and components, put them together, which is a you know collection of eight to 10 assets as a bundle for perfect racing or something, and then they resell it. Sometimes they give it away at low cost to a great user adaptation, but it's another form of adding value, right? It's basically sort of OEMing parts, if you will, and making a custom race car. So it's not just about, oh, let me resell it and talk about how great it is. Let me add other elements to it for this version or that version, you know, and, and you add value to that. And that sort of add value makes the community stronger, uh, makes the process stronger, uh, brings people closer together, right? I mean, there's so much, there's so much glue here um, in that process that, uh, and that's really what we love about sort of this whole thing about open digital assets. I love what you just said there because, you know, with all the, with NFTs and anything new that comes up in this space, my question is always, how does this apply to my real life, right? Like all of it kind of seems mostly theoretical when it first surfaces. And my, I'm always like, well, just tell me the practical implication of it. And that's why I love what you just said is like it builds community um, and it creates more of a social component and more of a collaboration component. So taking a step back to that, um, who are the people that are using Animoca or playing blockchain games right now, buying the NFTs out there? Who are the people doing it right now? Are they people like Matt, who's got a VR headset next to him on his desk? Um, and then how how long do uh, until normal people are using it? Not that you're not normal, Matt, um, but how long until the masses are using these things? And how do we get to that point? So I think one thing to understand perhaps is that I think the general people community globally of people who own NFTs is perhaps still only half a million, maybe 700,000 people, right? I mean, in the context of the world, that is still very small. But the reason we're seeing this explosive growth is that we went from 150,000 people last year to, you know, three, 400,000 people this, this, this first two months or more. So we're effectively witnessing a tripling of an audience, right? So we think, wow, look at all this growth. But unless we believe that non-fungible tokens has a mass, has a market appeal of no more than 10 million people, we still have a long way of growth to go. And so it's natural for the sort of innovator type people to be in the NFT stage. And that's what we're seeing right now, broadly speaking, right? Uh, we are experimenting um, in terms of how to bring non-blockchain people into the blockchain world. But I think it has to come from a place of value. But for games like Sandbox and particularly F1 Delta Time, uh, the ability to sort of understand NFTs and crypto is important because the game was designed that way. And one thing is that for that audience, it is also important, right? What happens on chain is important. Can I audit the ownership? Do I know it's real, right? You know, what happens on it? That is actually important for that audience because they care about that stuff. And when you do it right, then they're also willing to pay the premiums as opposed to maybe this is fake, right? Now, 
this may not be super important for people who are not in crypto. And I think in the mid to long term, that has to be the approach. So right now, for instance, with one of the one of our one of our companies, Quid, which is a digital collectible marketplace, but it's not a fully on blockchain in the sense that it or sort of began life as a mobile sort of as a, as a mobile sort of digital collecting experience. Uh, and they've got like 7 million collectors on there. So probably and with licenses from Marvel and that kind of stuff, but not blockchain yet. And uh, what they started experimenting on is, you know, not with crypto, but with cash accounts. Say, okay, if I end up getting some special sort of rare Marvel cards or sort of, you know, Panini NBA cards or all that kind of stuff, right? Then would someone be willing to pay cash for that digital collectible? Uh, in the same way that NBA Top Shot had the, sort of an experience, you know, obviously with different values involved. And it turned out that uh, there was a group of people who didn't have the time to farm these assets inside the game in a sort of game element, but were very willing to pay a premium for ownership of these rare cards. So a balancing mechanism came into play where you have an army of people playing for little money, essentially the mobile app to try to farm these assets in a gamified way. And when they happen to sort of chance upon a set or a collection or something rare and special, they would put it on a uh, sort of auction market in cash. And, uh, and then, you know, one of the collectors would pay for it in cash. So I think that could be perhaps one of the mechanisms in which you can bring in non, uh, non, uh, uh sort of blockchain guys because they have friction uh, with that. The way I look at crypto and NFT and blockchain gaming right now is I, I consider it as like sort of gaming for Wall Street. Right. So people who understand money and willing to spend a lot of it. Uh, and if you bring in the friction of people who are not in the Wall Street segment, but they see that there's value in money, they are more likely to go there. And I think that has been the power of NFTs and in the DeFi space, which is liquidity. Right. Without the liquidity, then NFTs would probably not be very effective. It needed to have the DeFi infrastructure. It needed to have the liquidity in the marketplace for it to have the appeal that it that it has today. For sure. I, I love all of that. I think the, our goal here too is to, you know, not just be having these conversations, talking to people who are already in the crypto and blockchain space, but to really help people outside of the space understand why this stuff is so cool. Um, and I love that you guys are doing that as well. Another practical application of NFTs is uh, something that you tweeted recently to Bill Gates, actually. So we all know Bill Gates back in 96 said content is keen. Um, and we've all heard this, but you tweeted at him that NFTs that uh, NFTs is the very definition of liberating content, ideas, and experiences in a truly decentralized manner that you believe he envisioned, Bill Gates envisioned, when he said content is keen back in 1996. So I just wanted to call this out and give you a chance to uh, explain or educate us on what is the connection between NFTs and content. Well, so when the internet really started to become sort of a promise, although still early, Many of us recognized, and of course, Bill Gates was one of the first ones to recognize that actually content would be king for one main reason, that anyone could sort of produce content. You wouldn't necessarily have to read content just in a newspaper or in a centralized sort of sort of large uh, sort of studio. Anyone could make content. Anyone could make a podcast. Anyone could make a blog and they could be heard because what the internet sort of 1.0 or web one, web, web two was effectively was this effective broadcasting mechanism, or if you will, a giant, super cheap photocopier that in time simply got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, right? So the cost of content distribution basically went down to zero. And that is the reason why knowledge broadly is a commodity. And we have all this information that we didn't have before. So that was great. That was wonderful. And so he sort of said, that's why content is king, because, you know, content is available to anyone. The ones who make the best content would win. But it turned out not to be quite true at that time because of the infrastructure that the internet had. Um, and sort of Jason Perelin um, then basically had a counter quote and he said, sure, content is king, but um, distribution is queen and she wears the pants. And the whole point of that quote basically is to say that without distribution, doesn't matter how great your content is, you will never be found. And this is where we find ourselves today in the internet, right? Can content be found if it's not on the app store? Can content be found if it's not on Netflix, right? You know, is it Game of Thrones or is it HBO, right? Is it Mario Brothers or is it Nintendo? Like, which is it, right? And I think this fight that we see, for instance, that Epic has with Apple, for instance, and many other cases is actually a great example how content is perhaps um, the emperor with no clothes, at least for the time being, right? And that is 
actually where we found ourselves a, a sort of a, a little known story, although actually quite well known story in 2012 is, you know, we were one of the largest mobile phone game developers in 2011. If you sort of search on history, you'll see that we dominated the charts. Uh, we were probably also the only at that point, uh, non sort of let's call it Western company that had such a prolific presence uh, on the App Store. At one point, we had 12 out of the 20 top spots in the App Store. Um, and uh, in January of 2012, um, Apple decided that we were a bad influence to the App Store and they pulled all of our apps just like that. Um, and uh, of course, at that point, things with that was kind of embarrassing and we didn't really talk about it much, but the, the whole industry knew that basically Animoca was uh, lost all of their apps there. And we basically were removed from the App Store for basically two years, which had a ma major impact on our business at the time. And then we moved on to Android and so on. But I think the biggest issue for us was, of course, that again, it was um, you know, effectively a kind of rug pull, if you will. But 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 in this context, a centralized organization, the the distribution outlet decided, for whatever reason, we don't like you, right? There was no appeals process. There was no due court order or something like that. There was nothing. It was just, that's how we feel like. That story, that deplatforming that we see, happens every day to some person around the world for any content creator. We may not necessarily agree with the content they're producing, but that choice is actually not yours effectively. And this is where non-fungible tokens are different because ultimately the content that is created is yours. It can't be removed. Sure, maybe the discovery might not be available in the same sense, but I can't actually sort of take it away from you. And it also means that the people who bought this content, you can't remove that. And why do we say that? And we say that because non-fungible tokens represent digital asset ownership. We foresee a future, particularly for games, where games are going to be using NFTs in multiple ways. So for instance, you know, take it from a digital fashion standpoint. If you're doing digital shoes and they were used by hundreds of games because they're cool, well, other games would choose to adapt the use of these shoes because they want the audience. They want the other owners of these shoes to play their games. So there's a natural reason to do that. In time, those shoes themselves become a platform. We describe this as content as a platform. And then ultimately, it doesn't matter that you're being deplatformed somewhere else because the people own the shoes themselves. You can't take away their shoes. And so they can go to any other ecosystem or environment with the ownership of their assets. And that's why we think that with NFTs, content is actually king. It's truly king because people will be making games and content and experiences based on the assets that you own, as opposed to us going to places where we are supposed to be sort of having those ex exclusive experiences in some kind of walled garden somewhere around the world, right? That's, that's kind of where this came from. I, um, well, this is one thing that I like to tell people, which is that, you know, blockchains can't kick you off, which is one of my, it's one of my favorite things. Like, you know, when you have trouble with, uh, deplatforming and all these different things that are happening around. And I agree with you. Um, I do want to kind of, maybe take a little pen prick and, and pop the hype on NFTs just a little bit here. <laughs> so, um, you know, what do you make of the NFT hype right now? I mean, it, it definitely feels like it's bub, you know, it's kind of looking like a bubble and it feels like it could burst. And a couple of the criticisms that I typically get on NFTs from people um, is like, uh, you know, who would want to buy, uh, um, you know, a JPEG, you know, for a million dollars, essentially, especially because the storage part hasn't been, um, I guess, beautifully solved. And for people at home who may not know this, when you, if you buy a piece of artwork on an NFT online, usually what that is, is it's a blockchain asset, and then it's pointing to, you know, the picture of that artwork, and it may have the signature of the uh, of the artist or there's authenticity. So you can know that it's coming from that person. Um, but I actually just have some questions for you. Like, what do you think are the good criticisms of the NFT market right now? And where are things that the, that people like ourselves in the NFT space can do to like try to solve some of what you see as the uh, problems for NFTs um, that maybe we've gotten ahead of ourselves? So, so like with anything, when there's money to be made and a lot of people rush into it, and aren't necessarily thinking about the long-term consequences or even the short-term consequences, right? And, you know, that is uh, one of the elements of sort of free market and capitalism we have to deal with, right? And, uh, you know, with any sort of new technology, you have a little bit of a hype cycle, perhaps. Um, although I would argue that, although it does feel very bubbly, I have a, a sort of a view that sort of mid to long-term, we are on the right track. And I'll get to that bit a little later. 
But I think one of the things that you mentioned, for instance, about sort of image rights and so on, I mean, you have, you can put your images on IPFS, right? You can have other ways in which you do that. I think the technology around to solve that will, will come. And I think what's missing right now is that we lack an understanding of what makes an NFT valuable. You know, we rely, for instance, for artwork uh, in terms of, oh, well, you know, I get a curator to verify it. And basically, you know, the art without the actual verification is not actually that valuable, right? Uh, and that's kind of what we should be looking for in blockchain. In the same way that, you know, you audit a contract or you audit your accounts, we should have an audit for you know, NFTs. And those are things that we haven't done yet because the market is not that mature for the time being. But eventually we will have to get there to ensure that the good stuff bubbles up. And so for the time being, just like with anything, you know, we would ask people to study, right? What is the NFT? Who's behind it? What's the background? You know, you know, are they anonymous? Are they not anonymous? Right? You know, all these little sort of warning signals that you can put to it. Uh, the other thing that you mentioned was around sort of, you know, yeah, could I just download the JPEG or so on? I mean, you know, often it's been said already. I mean, you know, a lithographic copy of a Mona Lisa is just not the same as the original, right? Uh, and I think, you know, I came to Hong Kong um, in 93 and back in 93, you know, Hong Kong still had a reputation uh, of sort of selling fake stuff. Uh, so fake Rolexes was kind of a big deal. And, you know, very few people around the world, actually, if any, necessarily brag about their fake Rolex, right? <laughs> you know, but we're having, a, having a fake Rolex is really more sort of an aspiration of, actually, I really want a real one. But they don't necessarily say, hey, look, this is fake. This is like awesome, right? Um, and I think that's true for, you know, any, for, for, for digital assets as well. You want to know that you have the original or the authentic one. So I think the way to look at NFTs is not necessarily just that, is it valuable per se? It's more about, is it something that's real, right? We don't necessarily want to show that we're carrying around something that's pirated, right? Originality or knowing that I bought something that benefits the artist may be good enough, right? We don't have to say that NFTs must be worth thousands of dollars each time. We just want to show that we have allegiance to the artist and creator. That's why we want to buy an original Nike or we want to buy an original something, not because we want to sort of, um, sort of pay more money, but because we are telling them that I care about you, that I care about having the real stuff. And that's where I think NFTs have that powerful signal of it's the real stuff. Whether it's worth $1 or $10,000, that's almost secondary as far as I'm concerned. Awesome. Well, yeah, I've, I have learned so much from you in this conversation and I've got so many questions written down that we won't even have time to get to. Uh, but we always end every podcast episode with a segment that I call explain your tweet. This is where I go through your Twitter and pull out a funny or interesting or insightful tweet. And you actually retweet a lot from, um, the brands that you support, but also, you know, a lot of insightful retweets as well. So definitely go check out Yacht's Twitter to, you know, just for good overall learning. Um, but I did find one tweet I'm going to call out that I, I found personally interesting. So, um, I, I love backpacking and climbing mountains and stuff. And I've, you know, done a few trips. I did Kilimanjaro, Patagonia, like several ba big backpacking trips. And I think I've read every Everest book out there. And so when I saw Saw this tweet you probably know it's coming now uh, when i saw this tweet it really stood out to me you tweeted on january 14th please consider supporting those who are in need in nepal uh, and this which is run by tashi tenzi and family member of tenzi norgay who's one of the most famous sherpas to climb everest he was uh, one of the first two people he got up there with sir edmund hillary yeah Exactly. So um, this is organized by your daughter. And then you said if you donated at least $10, share your address below and I will send you an NFT for my personal collection. So tell me more about this campaign, what it is, and then how many people actually uh, responded that they donated and then w what NFTs did you send them from your collection? Yeah. So the NFT that we ended up sending was um, sort of uh, dependent where which address they gave me. Uh, and then so it was actually it was a bunch of guys from 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 the wax community and so we issued some brats nfts uh, at the time so we i sent some from my personal collection so we had a licensing partnership deal with brats and uh, we sold some nfts that have actually become quite valuable as well um but i guess that's just the market right now and uh, we, we sort of passed them out sort of as a, as a sort of a freebie at the time when i gave them out they weren't that valuable <laughs> so so but but anyway uh the background on this is so tashi tenzing is a is a family friend of ours for quite a while we actually um, uh, supporting his schools um, for some time. He built uh, uh, schools um, to support 
really sort of young girls. Uh, one of the problems that girls in Nepal had, particularly in rural areas, was uh, child trafficking. And so essentially to combat child trafficking with education, so you had to build schools. So that was the background. And, uh, and so we had a relationship with that. And, uh, and our, our kids actually um, sort of uh, were, were sort of hiking the base camp trail, uh, you know, um, and I've been to Nepal many times. So we have a good relationship there with that. And, and I love Nepal, sort of, I'm, I'm a trekker, hiker, sort of, um, so sort of, sort of love, love nature. Uh, but because of COVID, right, it was tough. And uh, unlike uh, other places where you can have digital work, uh, sort of living the life of a Sherpa or living the rural life over there, you don't have much digital options, right? So you are restricted physically from doing stuff. So it affected people's ability to literally just get food and so on. So that was the campaign. Um, you know, we ended up having uh, quite a number of people sign up and support. Most of them were not from the NFT community. Um, you know, it was just like people who were supporting Nepal. I mean, it was like a GoFundMe. But yeah, I mean, it was, and it was also not a big campaign, campaign right? Um, but it was, uh, it was, um, it was successful. We closed it out. I'm very grateful for that. And of course, all the other guys from the NFT community that donated, um, you know, got their NFT. I actually think it's interesting as a potential model in the future, right? I think charity and donation models could work out interestingly that way. You know, an NFT doesn't necessarily have to represent anything of value. It could be just a memory of a moment that was truly yours or an achievement you made. A hundred percent. Um, so shout out that organization real quick, Tashi Tenzin's organization, so people can check it out and donate if they're able. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, it's, uh, the Green Tara Foundation is what it's called. Yeah. Awesome. And then, uh, post COVID, my first big trip is going to be ever space camp. So I'm going to be in touch with you and get some tips from your movie, get connected with your contacts there. Absolutely. Yes. It's all it's awesome. Well, yeah. Thanks so much, Yad. I really appreciate you being here. Before you go, just tell people where they can find you if they want to connect with you personally, um, and also where they can check out Animoca Brands. And if they're new to the blockchain gaming space, what are some of the you know initial, easy, and interesting and fun things they can do once they go on Animoca Brands? Well, I guess one, I mean, my Twitter is YSIU. It's pretty easy to find. It's probably the best way to interact with me. Uh, just because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's open and everyone sort of is, is there somehow t sort of crypto and Twitter have become sort of the place to be in some ways. Uh, in terms of our products, um, I invite you to take a look at several of them if you can. F1 Delta Time. Um, the other one is, of course, Sandbox. And probably from a pure crypto standpoint, Sandbox might even be the easiest experience because you can go there, start buying land and just learning about it. That seems to be an easy sort of translation. If you want to learn what we're doing with um, moving sort of uh, traditional games into blockchain, I invite you to take a look at Gamey. It's both on the App Store and on the website, G-A-M-E-E dot -E com. Uh, it's probably uh, it's a play to earn platform for games. Um, we think it's very powerful. And of course, the other one is Quid, uh, Q-U-I-D-D dot -D com. Uh, and then most recently, we also acquired Limpo, uh, so which which runs a Lim token to do sports NFTs. Uh, and actually, we have a bunch of other things, but I think I've said enough. So go check it out. That'll keep people busy for a little bit. Thanks so much, Yat. Really appreciate this. Thanks, Matt, for co-hosting with me as always. Uh, thank you, listeners, for tuning in. And we'll be back again soon with another episode of the Unstoppable Podcast. It was a great pleasure. Thank you.